The United States faces huge fiscal problems. A lot of bills are coming due that were promised long ago that we wouldn't have to worry about, about it. States have pension promises that they've made and the trillions of dollars that are beginning to come due. What is the upside of that? Well, the upside of it is that we have a lot of political creations, things like Social Security, uh, things like Medicare, things like the state, employees' unions and their political activities that are going to go away. And that's a good thing because they don't actually work. They don't solve the problems they're intended to solve. They take a lot of capital and energy and resources and human action that could be put into useful and constructive and productive things and fritter them away on politics. And the starvation and disappearance of these things, I think, will allow us to uh, create a different kind of uh, approach to social problems that will be not only more to our liking politically as, as libertarian-leaning people, but that will also actually address the problems that they're intended to address, to actually alleviate poverty and what's associated with it, to take care of things like education and health care for people who can't do it for themselves. Now, getting rid of those things uh, in principle, I, I think, are, are probably good, but it, it seems that the transition would be rather costly. Could be. Um, I mean, that's really the challenge going forward. Uh, once Congress understands that the question is no longer how we go about paying these bills, but how we go about not paying them, uh, then the question is, well, what do we do to get from where we are to a place that is sustainable and stable and, uh, and more reasonable? And of course, Congress can do some things to make that easier, for instance, by enacting real, meaningful, long-term sweeping entitlement reforms, uh, getting spending and other fiscal uh, concerns more into line. Or they can continue to do what they're doing and leave things to get much, much worse. I mean, there's no reason that we can't have an Argentina outcome or a Cyprus outcome or a Greece outcome, which, of course, is a very different thing for a country that constitutes one-fifth of the world's economy. No one's ever seen an economic crisis like that, and I'm not sure we ever really want to. Let's hope we don't. But um, I don't think that's the most likely outcome. I think that uh, as it becomes clear that we have to prioritize things, we have to start making some difficult decisions, and we have to allow, most important, the emergence of alternative institutions to deal with these social problems, I think that we will, in general, move in the right direction. I mean, there'll be some bumps and some starts and stops, but I'm fairly confident that we're going to do the right thing. A, a complaint that I hear a lot from Republicans, particularly in these last couple of election cycles, is that look, we're, we're addicting more and more people to the benefits of government largesse. We're running out of money, but there will not be uh, a willingness on the part of voters to simply break the habit. No, and there never will be. Um, getting rid of spending, getting rid of give me free stuff, write me a check every month. Uh, and there's never going to be a constituency for that. Uh, that's why I sort of, in my way, look forward to the upcoming fiscal crunch because that's really the only way to get rid of this stuff. I mean, if you're waiting for entitlement reform to get politically popular, it's going to be a very, very long wait for a train that doesn't come. Uh, but you get to a point where economic reality overrules political reality, and at that point, you have to act. Although you know, there are times when I think that uh, people do kind of get it. So if you talk about things like means testing, people I have no idea what you're talking about, and uh, I think it sounds scary, but if you ask him, why is Bill Gates going to get a check from the government every month when he turns 65? Why is Warren Buffett getting his health care paid for by the government? Well, people start to understand at that point. Say, well, okay, maybe we don't want means testing across the middle class, but okay, we understand in the case of, say, Bill Gates. Once you've established in principle what these programs are actually there to do and how we should go about reforming them, then the rest of it becomes sort of an engineering question. Uh, speaking of that engineering question among states, what do you think is the role of federalism, the role of people being able to move from state to state yeah. in sort of speeding the plow toward these types of reforms? Well, you get dramatically different outcomes, of course. Uh, one of the things I like about federalism is that uh, if you've got 50 different regimes instead of one, you've got 50 chances to get things right. And, uh, and of course, there's not necessarily one right. There are different ways to do different sorts of things. And I certainly think that uh, dealing with a lot of these problems, things like education, things like health care for the indigent, would be much better done at the state level and at the local level, or even the county level. You know, we often overlook the importance of counties as an organizing unit, but counties are 
you know, big enough that they bring efficiencies, but small enough that they're manageable. Um, I rather, I rather like that as an approach. So, um, but of course, the states are some of them are going the opposite direction right now. You've got states that are basically broke, like California and Illinois. Uh, the states, in aggregate, have something between I want to say it's around three trillion dollars just in unfunded pension liabilities. Uh, some of them are looking at situations in which their pension costs alone are going to eat up all their tax revenue. Uh, they're going to come to the federal government looking for a bailout. And uh, they're going to be disappointed, I think, because the federal government doesn't want all that debt coming onto their books because it'll be just ruinous. But then you end up with a really interesting situation where you've got, say, in California, you've got a constitutional mandate that says you have to pay these pension benefits. You've got nothing in the bank to do it with. You've got no legal precedent for a state being uh, insolvent. We've got bankruptcy law for cities and municipalities, but not for states. Where that's going to come out is anyone's guess. It should be interesting, though. Um, Shame about what they've done in California. That was the most beautiful place in the world and uh, full of some of the most productive and interesting and in innovative people, and it's just been destroyed. I think a lot of people probably would have a hard time believing your argument that civil society is really going to mm -hmm. pick, pick up the ball and run with it in terms of solving problems for libertarians and many conservatives and many progressives. That's not a surprising thing. Yeah. But... Uh, give these people some comfort uh, about how civil society will will take care of uh, many of these problems. Yeah, I just always, you know, I think this is where Hobbes has really done us a disservice. Now, I, I like Hobbes a lot. And I think he was an interesting thinker. But Hobbes had this very, you know, A or B binary approach. It was Leviathan or the state of nature, you know, totalitarianism or anarchy, the wrong kind of anarchy, you know, really chaotic war of all against all. But those aren't the only two possible outcomes. And the thing I always try to remind people, especially in the case of the United States, is that we're not poor and we aren't savages. Um, we are not going to let people starve in the streets. We're not going to roll over people with steamrollers. You know, we're not going to be that kind of society. Uh, the more you create room for people to innovate on their own to solve their own problems or to help solve other people's problems for them, uh, the more people will step into there and do it. You know, we've got a situation right now in which the amount of capital and wealth being consumed and destroyed by the federal government is more than adequate for dealing with most of the social challenges that we're thinking about in terms of what do we do about education, what do we do about health care, what do we do about poor people who are old. These are expensive problems to solve, but they're not so expensive that they're undoable. But when you're taking as much uh, of the national income as we are and essentially just destroying it, then you've got a lot less left over to work with. I, I think a lot of libertarians were, at least in the 2000s, very uh, discouraged by the direction of the Republican Party because we remember the 90s and how at least radical some, some Republicans appeared mm -hmm. in terms of wanting to send a lot of these responsibilities back to states to be dealt with however they would deal with them. Now we have uh, a Tea Party movement that may or may not prove to be uh, as, as radical as we might hope. What do you think? Yeah, it's always hard to tell with populist movements because by their nature, they're unpredictable. Uh, what captures people's imaginations will move. Uh, one of the things I like about the Tea Party, and here I'll also even put in a good word for Occupy, even though they're you know, mostly misguided uh, leftists who, if left to their own devices, would make our problems a lot worse. But intuiting that there is something wrong with Washington, where we are, that there is something unhealthy about Washington's relationship with Wall Street, uh, that what we're talking about in America is not entirely the free market, but this uh, you know, crony capitalism of people buying and selling favors. They're right about that. Uh, you know, Occupy is right about that. The Tea Party is right about that. Now, they aren't always right about uh, the policy solutions that they would apply to that. They're not always right about who the uh, the aggressor really is in this situation. But I think that you've got the fact that you've got a movement on the populist right and a movement on the populist left that are actually in some important ways seeing the same problem and seeing it, if not from the same point of view, they're appreciating the same defective features of it. And I think that's a useful place to start a, uh, a conversation about how to go about uh, solving this. <laughs>